Right, so we're going to start our cardiovascular physiology three lecture series by talking about blood. Right? Blood represents about 8% of your total body weight. Okay, so a good chunk of your body weight is blood. On average, women have about five liters. Men have five and a half because on average, men are larger, right? That's why they tend to have about half a liter of blood more. We have three types of cells in our bloodstream, okay? And the extracellular fluid of our bloodstream is plasma. Okay, so the extracellular fluid found within the cardiovascular system is plasma. And those three types of cells are suspended in it. And so we're going to talk about all three types of cells. We're going to talk about erythrocytes, which are your red blood cells. There are these fat little biconcave discs being shown here. They are oxygen transport machines, right? Then we're going to talk about leukocytes. So there are these crazy looking white blood cells here with all these spiny processes. Okay, they are your immune system's mobile portion. Okay, so we're going to talk about our white blood cells. When we talk about the bloodstream, we'll go through the function of all our white blood cells. Then we'll talk about white blood cells again when we talk about the immune system at the end of the semester. Okay, and then the last cellular element are platelets. These are just cell fragments, and they're important in hemostasis. Okay. So in lab, you guys did this, okay? You didn't take an entire tube of blood, right? All you had to do was fill up one of those capillary tubes, and then you spun it in the centrifuge, and the heavier, and hopefully you capped one end, right? <laughs> and you put that capped end to the outside of your giggles. I bet there were some that didn't get capped properly, or the capped end didn't get put to the outside of the centrifuge. But heavier elements came to the bottom, and those are your erythrocytes. And you should have had about 45% of the total volume was red blood cells. Okay, some of you might have had a little higher, especially if you are athletes or if you're spending a lot of time up skiing. Okay, because altitude and training at altitude increases your hematocrit. Some of you might have been a little low, because we often have anemic college students, and oftentimes you are female, right? Then, some of you might have been able to see your buffy coat. Okay, that was less than 1%, and those are your platelets and leukocytes. Okay, sometimes you can't see the buffy coat, though, in those hematocrit tubes. And then 55% was plasma, okay? The water portion. So we're gonna talk about plasma, then erythrocytes, then leukocytes, and then platelets and hemostasis. This is all in chapter 15. So we're skipping a couple chapters and then we're gonna go back to them. We're gonna cover blood first because it's a nice little easy break before we do cardiovascular physiology. Okay, so for plasma, I've made you this really nice study aid. This is everything you need to know about plasma, okay? Plasma is primarily water, okay? 90% of plasma is water. Water acts as the transport medium. It is the solvent, but it also plays a really important role in having a high carrying capacity for heat, okay? So when you're hot, what happens to the blood vessels supplying your skin surface? Do they vasodilate or do they vasoconstrict when you are hot? They dilate, so your face flushes, right? It gets really red because you're sending a whole bunch of blood to your skin. Not because your skin is super active, but in order for some of that heat that your, your blood has picked up in your skeletal muscles, right? To be given off to the ambient environment, okay? And then when you're cold, like when you were running from your car to class just now, because you just got here, okay? You're gonna have vasoconstriction in order to hold that heat within your body, okay? So plasma plays a really important role in carrying heat away from organs that are producing it and allowing it to dissipate to the external environment. 
Okay, about 1% of your plasma are your electrolytes, and we have talked in detail about the role of your electrolytes. They play a huge role in membrane excitability. Okay, so we're talking sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride. Those are what your electrolytes are. Okay, also allow for osmotic distribution of fluid between extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. Okay, so we maintain the amount of electrolytes in our plasma to maintain the amount of electrolytes in our interstitial fluid to maintain the amount of electrolytes and keep our cells plump and happy. Okay, also electrolytes buffer pH changes. So some of those electrolytes, so electrolytes are anything that are charged, are hydrogen ions, so H plus. Okay, increases in H plus do what to pH? Decrease pH. Okay, and then our other major buffer is bicarbonate, HCO3 negative. Okay, so major role in buffering the pH of blood to keep it nice and neutral. Okay, one to three percent of your plasma is nutrients, so things like glucose, amino acids, Okay, waste products like bilirubin, which we'll talk about. It's a waste product of red blood cell breakdown. Okay, gases, oxygen and CO2. There's a little bit of oxygen and CO2 that are being transported, just dissolved in plasma. But most oxygen and CO2 are carried in other ways. So we are going to talk about the bloodstream again when we talk about the respiratory system. Okay, so we're not talking about the bloodstream at the end of today, right? And then you also have some hormones, things like insulin, glucagon, etc. Okay, plasma proteins, so all these are plasma proteins, make up six to eight percent of your plasma. And your plasma proteins, all of them together, exert what's called an osmotic effect to prevent all the water in your bloodstream from entering your tissues. Okay, so when you have swelling of tissues or too much fluid leaving the bloodstream and entering tissues, that's called edema, swelling of the tissues, right? It's uncomfortable. So you want plasma proteins which will draw water back in at the end of capillary beds. Okay, so all plasma proteins help affect this or help maintain this osmotic balance. Okay, all proteins will act as buffers as well because of those carboxyl groups. So a buffer is anything that can take up or release hydrogen ions. So those carboxyl groups can release hydrogen ions when pH increases or they can bind hydrogen ions when pH is decreasing. Okay, all plasma proteins do that. They all exert an osmotic effect and they all help buffer. Okay, and then we have our plasma proteins broken out into different categories. Albumins, right, make up 60% of your plasma proteins, okay, or albumins. And they just non specifically transport substances. Because there are a lot of things that are not water soluble that you want to get around to your cells. Okay, and blood is using water as the solvent. So albumin will just non-specifically bind anything that's not particularly water soluble in order to bring it to its proper location. Okay, because it's the most abundant plasma protein, it also contributes most to that osmotic effect. And that osmotic effect we're now calling the colloid osmotic pressure. Who knows what a colloid is? We talked about colloids yet. Mayonnaise is a colloid. Who makes their own mayonnaise? Do we have any hipsters in here who make artisanal mayonnaise? No. What's in mayonnaise? Who even knows what's in the mayonnaise? Egg whites and? There's more than just egg white. Oil and? There is some salt. Vinegar. Okay, so normally what happens if you mix oil and vinegar? If you, if you make your own salad dressing, what does it normally do? You shake it up and then it immediately separates, separates right? Because vinegar is water, oil and water don't mix, right? So 
Mayonnaise is a colloid. The proteins in the eggs suspend the oil in the vinegar. So that is what albumin is doing to your bloodstream. You have all these non-water soluble substances that are suspended in plasma. Okay, so your bloodstream is a colloid. It's not as thick as mayonnaise. Let's just hope not. Okay, but it is a colloid. Milk, whole milk is also a colloid. Okay, so you can think of your blood as more like whole milk. Okay, a bunch of fat suspended in a liquid matrix via proteins. Okay, we also have what are called alpha and beta globins, or globulins, sorry. And these specifically transport water insoluble substances. Okay, our clotting factors are also globulins. And then we've got a lot of inactive precursor molecules. So there's lots of different alpha and beta globulins, right? They're made by the liver, as is albumin. Okay. Play lots of different roles. We'll talk about them throughout the semester. Okay, our gamma globulins are our antibodies. Okay, so antibodies are proteins, part of the immune system. And then fibrinogen, we'll talk about the end of the lecture. That's an inactive precursor of fibrin. Okay, and once it gets activated into fibrin, it forms the mesh that your blood clot forms from. Okay, so blood actually gets trapped and you, from having flowing liquid blood to a solid clot. Okay, so we did plasma all on one slide. Hopefully it wasn't too boring, okay? It's a good study tool. Everything you need to know about plasma was on that one slide. So let's talk about erythrocytes or red blood cells next. Okay, so your RBCs or red blood cells or erythrocytes are pretty simple cells. They have no nucleus, so they lose their nucleus before they leave the bone marrow. They have no organelles, and they have no ribosomes. So this means no protein synthesis, okay? No organelles means no mitochondria, right? Very simple. They are oxygen transport machines. So they're not using the oxygen because they don't have any mitochondria. They're just carrying the oxygen to all your cells that do have mitochondria. Yeah? It is. Yep. It's considered a living cell. It doesn't have a nucleus. It can't replicate itself outside of the bone marrow, but it's considered a living cell. It maintains membrane potential, right? It does glycolysis. It performs a vital function. So we're going to call it a living cell. It's not dead. Yep. And it keeps you alive, right? Okay, so our red blood cells are shaped like biconcave discs. And this is really important. It provides an increase in the surface area for diffusion to occur. Okay, so diffusion rate is directly proportional to the surface area. The greater the surface area, the faster the diffusion rate. So this means oxygen, oxygen can diffuse into your red blood cells really fast at your lungs and then can diffuse out of your red blood cells really fast at your tissues. Okay, so you want fast diffusion rates of oxygen. Okay, it also has a really thin membrane as well to decrease the diffusion distance, which also increases diffusion rate. Okay, it also has a really flexible membrane so that it can squeeze through capillaries because your red blood cells have to squeeze through your capillaries one at a time. You've probably heard of sickle cell anemia. So in sickle cell anemia, people have sickle-shaped red blood cells, not nice plump biconcave discs, right? And they actually get trapped on each other. Okay, they don't squeeze through as well, which leads to all sorts of issues. Okay, the one thing red blood cells do have is loads of hemoglobin, right? So hemoglobin is a protein 
found in your red blood cells. And each red blood cell has more than 250 hemoglobin molecules. And each hemoglobin molecule has four binding sites for oxygen. So that means each molecule of hemoglobin can carry four oxygen. So that means you have a billion or more oxygen molecules being carried by your red blood cells. Okay, they are oxygen carrying machines. Hemoglobin contains iron. When iron is bound to oxygen, it is reddish, bright red in appearance. Okay, when it is deoxygenated, i.e. not bound to oxygen, it is bluish in appearance. So this is why in your textbook, oxygenated blood is always color-coded red and deoxygenated blood is always color-coded blue, right? And if you nick someone and bright red blood spurts out, you're in trouble, okay? Because you've hit an artery. Okay, hemoglobin has two parts, the globin portion, so this is the protein portion, or the heme portion, and this is where the iron is contained. So this is non-protein. Okay, each globin portion has one heme group, right? And each heme group can carry one molecule of oxygen. So there's four globin portions, four heme groups, four molecules of oxygen. So let's look at it. Okay, so here we have hemoglobin. We've got four polypeptide globin portions. Each one has a heme group associated with it. And here's a blow up of that heme group. Here's iron, Fe is iron. Okay, this is the oxygen binding portion. When oxygen's bound to that iron, it's red. When it's unbound, it's bluish. Okay, primary role of hemoglobin is to carry oxygen because oxygen is not water soluble. So if we did not have a carrier protein for it, and buttloads of carrier protein for it, we would never get enough oxygen to our cells, right? Because most of our cells are too far from the atmospheric air to get oxygen on their own, okay? So our circulatory system is carrying oxygen to our cells. And what's the role of oxygen in our cells? What do our cells want oxygen? To make energy, because oxygen is that terminal electron acceptor. We can't do aerobic respiration without oxygen. Our mitochondria don't work without oxygen. Okay, hemoglobin binds other things besides oxygen, okay? It will bind carbon dioxide as well. So at our tissues, it will release oxygen and then bind some of the CO2 and take that CO2 to our lungs and we'll exhale the CO2. Okay, hemoglobin will also bind hydrogen ions. This also happens at our tissues. As it unbinds oxygen and our tissues are really active, they start to produce more and more CO2, right? And then carbon dioxide plus water. Let's erase this. Right, so active tissues produce carbon dioxide from aerobic respiration, so clipping apart glucose or fatty acids, right? All those carbons and oxygens get released as carbon dioxide. So CO2 plus H2O via the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, we get carbonic acid, which, because it's an acid, will naturally disassociate and release hydrogen ions. Okay, so there we get our bicarb. Okay, so add active tissues. Oxygen is being unloaded, some of the carbon dioxide is being picked up, some of the hydrogen ions are being picked up. Right? Unfortunately, hemoglobin has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide, so CO, than oxygen. And this is why carbon monoxide poisoning is really horrible. Right? So untuned furnaces, space heaters, etc., produce carbon monoxide as a byproduct of combustion. Okay, and if carbon monoxide levels become too high, you asphyxiate. 
right? So your hemoglobin preferentially binds the carbon monoxide over the oxygen. So even though there's plenty of oxygen in the room, your hemoglobin preferentially binds carbon monoxide, then won't bind oxygen and you asphyxiate despite being plenty of oxygen environments. This is the time of year where carbon monoxide poisoning occurs. Yeah. At some point in time, is it able? Is that uh, red blood cell able to unbind from it, or is that red blood cell just useless? Oh no, no. So eventually, it will unbind. But what they do with people who have been exposed to carbon monoxide poisoning is they actually put them in a barometric chamber and put them under higher pressure in order to get that hemoglobin to unbind the carbon monoxide. So if it's seriously, if it's a seriously bad carbon monoxide poisoning, if it's, you know, just mild, like you were just nauseous and your alarm went off and you got out of the house, right, they'll just keep you in fresh air for a while. But yeah. Okay. The other thing that hemoglobin binds is nitric oxide. This is not nitrous oxide, i.e. laughing gas you get at the dentist. Okay, nitric oxide is a vasodilator produced in the lungs. Okay, so it's produced in the lungs and it's carried by hemoglobin to tissues and will cause them to vasodilate. Okay, besides hemoglobin, there's a couple other things in your erythrocytes. Okay, they can do glycolysis. Right? So they've got glycolytic enzymes to produce ATP that they need to maintain their membrane potential. Okay? Because they are living cells. They have a membrane potential. Okay? They also have the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, which I just mentioned. Okay? So your red blood cells play a major role in converting carbon dioxide plus water to carbonic acid. Okay, and then carbonic acid naturally disassociates into a hydrogen ion and bicarb. And bicarbonate is the primary way that carbon dioxide is carried in the bloodstream. Because CO2 is also not particularly water soluble. But hemoglobin doesn't love CO2 the way it loves oxygen. Right? So you have to have an alternative way to carry carbon dioxide. And that alternative way is to convert it into carbonic acid. So at your active tissues, carbonic anhydrase makes carbonic acid. And then at your lungs, carbonic anhydrase makes CO2 for you to exhale. So it does both the forward and the reverse reactions. Okay. But that's about it that's in your red blood cells. Right? They are oxygen carrying machines. Right. Your red blood cells kind of have a short lifespan because they can't make proteins, they can't regenerate their membranes, etc. So they last about 120 days. So that means you have to constantly replace them. Okay, so if you have your spleen, your spleen removes most of your old erythrocytes from circulation. Okay, if you have your spleen removed, then your liver will take over. Right, if you still have your spleen, it removes most of your old erythrocytes. Okay, so you replace your erythrocytes at two to three million cells per second. Okay, and the process of making new erythrocytes is called erythropoiesis. And it occurs in your bone marrow. Okay, so in your bone marrow you have what are called pluripotent stem cells. These are stem cells that can turn into all your different types of blood cells, but not any cell. Okay, so you can't make a liver cell from them, so they're not true omnipotent stem cells. They're just pluripotent because it can turn into all the different types of blood cells. Okay, so here it's even been called, this pluripotent stem cell is being called hematopoietic. So hematopoietic means turns into the blood cells. Okay, this hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow can become a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. Okay, the lymphoid stem cells become your lymphocytes, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Okay, the myeloid stem cells, some of them become reticulocytes. They lose their nucleus and then become erythrocytes. Okay, some of those myeloid stem cells become megakaryocytes, which shed portions of themselves, which are the platelets. And then the rest of them become our other types of white blood cells, so eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, or macrophages. Okay, but we're talking about red blood cells right now. So, to make more red blood cells, you need some nutrients. 
right? One of which is iron, because <coughs> it's an integral portion of that heme group. Okay, so men on average have 13 to 18 grams of iron per deciliter of blood. Women have 12 to 16 because of menstruation. Right? You also need folic acid. So that's one of the B vitamins for DNA replication. Okay, so those reticulocytes have to replicate themselves. So they need folic acid. Right, and then you also need vitamin B12 for DNA replication as well. Right, so our spleen filters out, removes our old red blood cells. Okay, they phagocytize. So you have these macrophages or white blood cells that hang out in your spleen all the time, and they phagocytize or engulf your worn out red blood cells. Okay, and then they're gonna break down all the components. And then your liver metabolizes those byproducts. Okay, so hemoglobin has the globin portion and the heme portion. The globin portion is just polypeptides, so it can be broken down, amino acids reused. Okay, the heme portion, the iron's gonna be removed and recycled. Okay, and then the leftover heme portion is what becomes bilirubin, right? And bilirubin gets into your bloodstream. The liver is going to release or excrete some of the bilirubin in bile, okay? And then the rest of the bilirubin gets excreted in urine. And bilirubin is what colors your urine yellow and your feces brown. Okay, so here we have the life cycle of a red blood cell. Okay, so erythropoiesis, or production of red blood cells, occurs in the bone marrow, and it's increased in response to the hormone erythropoietin, so EPO. EPO is produced by your kidneys. You might think, what the heck do your kidneys have to do with producing more red blood cells? Right? Your kidneys are what are called a conditioning organ. They receive a greater blood supply than they need for their own metabolic needs. Because what are your kidneys doing? Filtering. Filtering, exactly. Okay, so your kidneys are in a unique situation to determine oxygen carrying capacity. So when your kidneys notice that you don't have as many red blood cells as you used to in your bloodstream, they release the hormone erythropoietin, which then tells your bone marrow to make more red blood cells. Okay, in order to make those red blood cells, need some iron. And iron is not particularly water soluble, so it's carried in the bloodstream by a protein, a plasma protein called transferrin. So that's what the T iron is. That's iron being carried by transferrin. Okay, those new red blood cells get released in the bloodstream. They circulate for like 120 days, and then they're gonna be pulled out by the spleen. So this is the spleen right here, this nice brown organ, okay? So your spleen has macrophages that engulf their erythrocytes, break them down. The globin portion gets broken down to amino acids. They just get recycled and reused. The heme portion, the iron gets taken off. It's given to transferrin to circulate in the bloodstream. And then the bilirubin is released, goes into the liver, gets excreted as bile, okay? Or it's gonna go to the kidney and get excreted in the urine, okay? So it's either gonna leave via the feces or the urine. Okay, your liver also stores iron. So that iron on transferrin, right, gets picked up and stored in the liver by ferritin. So that's what F iron is. Okay. And then whole process starts again as red blood cell numbers decrease. Anemia, or low red blood cell numbers, is a pretty common condition. So it's below num normal oxygen carrying capacity. Okay, and it's usually diagnosed because someone has a low hematocrit, right? So when we looked at that slide where around 45% of total blood volume should be red blood cells, when someone has lower than that, 
they can be called anemic. And the reason why anemia is so common is because there's loads of causes of it. Okay, the most common cause is often nutritional anemia, especially iron deficiency. So if you don't take in enough iron, you can't make more red blood cells. Okay. Pernicious anemia is also due to dietary issues. So pernicious anemia is a lack of B12. Okay, and there's a genetic disorder where people don't make this protein called intrinsic factor, which allows for the absorption of B12. So those people have to get injections of B12 because no matter how much B12 they take in their diet, they're never gonna absorb it. Okay, so they have to get injections of B12. Vegans who don't eat a lot of fermented products, okay, can also get B12 deficiencies. So animal products are super high in B12, as are fermented products, so things that are yogurt, etc., which is vegans don't eat, right? So anything that microbes ferment oftentimes has a lot of B12. Okay. Aplastic anemia is where you actually get destruction of the bone marrow. Obviously can't make red blood cells if your bone marrow is destroyed. That could be to radiation exposure. Okay. Renal anemia is where you have kidney issues. So oftentimes people will go into kidney failure, they won't produce EPO anymore, and then they'll become anemic. Okay. Hemorrhagic anemia is where you have excessive blood loss like after childbearing, right? Or hemolytic anemia is where you get hemolysis of your circulating red blood cells. And that's often toxin-induced, right? The opposite of anemia is polycythemia, where you have too many red blood cells. Your hematocrit is elevated. Yeah? Um, real quick. We're gonna look at that. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. So polycythemia is where your hematocrit is high, and it can be primary, secondary, or relative. Primary is a tumor-like condition where you're just producing way too many red blood cells. Okay. A lot of you might have secondary polycythemia. So if you had a higher than average hematocrit in lab, right, and you are athletic or you're a big skier. Okay, you may have secondary polycythemia, where the low oxygen environment at altitude, right, causes your kidneys to think you have a lower than normal oxygen carrying capacity, so they release EPO, which causes you to make more red blood cells. Okay. So I guarantee if we surveyed a human physiology class in Louisiana, right, their hematocrits on average would be lower than yours we live at a higher altitude in a lower oxygen environment. Okay, a lot of you probably also had relative polycythemia because we tend to find you guys are often dehydrated, right? You didn't have enough plasma. Okay, so here we have a series of hematocrits. So normal is around 45%, 30% and below is anemic. Okay, 70% you've got polycythemia and here showing dehydration. Okay, you just have too little plasma. This one is solved really easily. How? Drink just drink some water. Exactly. Okay. Any questions about those red blood cells? Okay. Let's talk about our white blood cells then, our leukocytes. Right, so our leukocytes are our WBCs, or our white blood cells, and they're part of our immune system. Okay, our immune system is made up of our leukocytes, their derivatives, right, as well as plasma proteins. So their derivatives are the signaling molecules that white blood cells release, okay, and then things like our complement proteins and interferons, would be the plasma proteins associated with the immune system, right? A role of our immune system is to recognize and destroy or neutralize anything we detect as foreign. Okay, so bacteria, 
viruses, right? Also, though, your immune system plays a really important role in defending against cancer. Okay, so defending against non-self and self gone wrong, which is what cancer is. And then, of course, your immune system also acts as the cleanup crew. So in normal situations, your white or your red blood cells, right, get phagocytized by macrophages, which are leukocytes. Right, that's just a normal process. So even if you're not fighting an infection, your white blood cells have something to do. Right, they're acting as the cleanup crew, getting rid of any damaged body cells. Okay, white blood cells are called white because they are colorless, and that is because they have no hemoglobin. They do not transport oxygen. Okay, they are larger than your red blood cells. And we're going to talk about five different types. And they're enlisted in order right here from most numerous to least numerous. And the way I remember it, one of my students once told me this, and it really stuck with me, and maybe it'll stick with you, is never let men eat burritos. Okay, So neutrophils are the most numerous, basophils are the least numerous. So we're going to talk about the roles of each of these five types. Okay, we're gonna separate them into different categories. We've got the polymorphonuclear granulocytes, which is a mouthful, and the mononuclear agranular sites. So polymorphonuclear just means many-shaped nucleus, okay, and they contain granules. These are our neutrophils, our eosinophils, and our basophils. These are named for their dye preference. So when we stain them to see them, because they are colorless, you can't see them without a stain. Right? So we use different types of stain. We use the red dye eosin and basic blue dye. Neutrophils like both the same. So they often look purple because red and blue make purple. Okay? So the neutrophils often look purple because they, they take up both the red dye and the basic blue dye. Okay? Eosinophils like the red dye eosin, hence they're called eosinophils. Basophils like the basic blue dye, so they get named basophils. Okay, mononuclear agranulocytes contain a single nucleus, often it's the largest thing inside the cell, and they don't have any granulocytes. So these are our monocytes and our lymphocytes. Right, and let's look at this fun little cartoon. So here we have agranular versus granular. Okay, and we've got our lymphocytes, which make up 20 to 25% of circulating white blood cells. And our lymphocytes are our T cells, our B cells, and our natural killer cells. Notice that they're like all nucleus. Okay. Here's our monocytes that have these kidney-shaped nuclei to make up 3 to 8% of our circulating white blood cells. They are immature macrophages. So in the bloodstream, they don't do anything. They're just waiting to migrate into our tissues where they become our macrophages and hang out there for life. Hey, granular, notice we've got all these little granules in the cytoplasm. Basophils pick up mainly blue. Neutrophils pick up blue and red and look purplish. Eosinophils pick up only red. Neutrophils are most numerous, 60 to 70%. Eosinophils only 2 to 4%. Basophils, 0.1 to 1. The reason why there's ranges is because depending on if you're fighting infection and what type of infection it is, you'll have different amounts of white blood cells. Okay. Your leukocytes ultimately come from your bone marrow, but some of them replicate themselves outside of the bone marrow because they do have nuclei, so they can do cell replication. Okay, all of your granulocytes, so your eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils, and then your monocytes are only made in the bone marrow. They do not replicate themselves outside the bone marrow. Okay, most new lymphocytes, so your T cells and B cells, get produced by lymphocytes already hanging out in your lymphoid tissues, like your lymph nodes, your tonsils, etc. Okay, so they replicate themselves outside of the bone marrow, right? And then number of white blood cells and relative makeup depends on what you're fighting off or if you're fighting anything off at that time. 
Okay, so they have an increase in white blood cell numbers when you're fighting an infection than when you're not. Okay, so most numerous, and you notice that this is saying an even larger variation, 50 to 80% of your circulating leukocytes are your neutrophils, and they are your phagocytic specialists. So phagocytosis, remember, is cell eating, so they're gonna engulf things in your bloodstream. Okay, they will also leave the bloodstream and help engulf things in tissues that have become infected. Okay, they are the first defenders on the scene of bacterial invasion. So when you are fighting a bacterial infection, you're gonna have huge increases in neutrophil numbers. Okay, they also play a major role in the inflammatory response. Okay, and they can actually leave the bloodstream and go to that site of infection, right? They are first on the scene and last off the scene because they're phagocytic specialists they scavenge all that debris left behind. Okay, so first on and first off the scene. Okay, lymphocytes are the second most numerous and they're 20 to 40%. Okay, and they have specific targets they're programmed against. They're part of your specific branch of your immune cells. Okay, so these are your T cells and your B cells. Your B cells make your antibodies. Your T cells will attack cells infected by viruses or that have become cancerous. Okay, and they are super effective and they're what give you immunity. Okay, so on the second exposure to an antigen, they mount such an effective immune response that you clear the infection before you even show symptoms. Okay, so when you get vaccinated, you're making T cells and B cells that are gonna be ready when you actually get exposed to that virus or bacteria. Okay, they only live about 100 to 300 days, but remember they replicate themselves outside of the bone marrow. Okay, so when they live for 100 to 300 days before they die, it's just that they replicate. Okay, monocytes make up only two to 8%. Okay, and they're immature when they're, when they're in the bloodstream. So here's a monocyte, they have that kidney-shaped nucleus. Okay, and what they do is they actually move from the bloodstream into your tissues. And then they're gonna live in that tissue. So you have a whole bunch of macrophages that are spending their entire life in your spleen, right? And when they move to specific tissue, they become phagocytic specialists in that tissue. So you have macrophages hanging out in your lungs, macrophages hanging out in your spleen, macrophages hanging out, you know, in your adipose tissue, et cetera. So that if something, bacteria, viruses, et cetera, infect that particular tissue, you've got macrophages on the scene, okay? And they can last several months to years. Okay, eosinophils make up only one to 4% of your circulating leukocytes. Right? And increases in eosinophils is called eosinophilia. Eosinophils increase in number due to allergies. Okay? Eosinophils evolved to fight off parasites. Right? And parasites are multicellular animals that we've done a really good job of developing drugs to kill off. Right, so most people in developed countries do not get parasites anymore. We have really effective treatments for them. So we have this whole branch of our immune system whose target we have basically wiped out, right? And it gets bored. And then it targets things like pollen, right? And causes allergies. So there's a lot more allergies in developed countries than in countries where you still have parasites, right? However, parasites are bad. So you don't want to have parasites. Allergies are probably better than parasites. So anyway, there's a whole you know, line of research trying to figure out how to keep this branch of your immune system busy without actually having a parasite. 
okay, so that you don't suffer from allergies anymore. Okay, eosinophils evolve to kill those parasites, but then also cause allergic reactions. Basophils also play a role in parasite defense, and therefore now play a role in allergies. Really low numbers, only 1% of circulating leukocytes. Okay, they synthesize, store, and release histamine and heparin. So when you have allergies, what do you take? Antihistamines. Histamine causes the swelling response. Okay, so swelling of your mucous membranes, etc. Heparin is an anticoagulant, so it's going to keep blood flowing in the area. Okay, any questions about those leukocytes? No? Right. Let's talk a little briefly about platelets. There's a quiz question about platelets, also known as thrombocytes. Okay, they are cell fragments. They're shed from megakaryocytes, and megakaryocytes hang out in the bone marrow. They lack nuclei, however, they do have organelles. Okay, so they can do protein synthesis and generate energy. Okay, so they do have some mitochondria. They have loads of actin and myosin. What do actin and myosin do in skeletal muscle? Contract. So it's not highly arranged in sarcomeres in our platelets, right? But our platelets do contract when they form the platelet plug. Okay, and it's that actin and myosin that allows them to do that contraction. Platelets play a role in hemostasis, right? And here, they're just cell fragments. Here's a red blood cell, here's a platelet. They vary in number from 100,000 to 500,000 platelets per mil of blood. A whole bunch of your platelets get stored in your spleen, and when you have a bleeding event, your spleen contracts. Your sympathetic nervous system causes your spleen to contract and release a whole bunch of platelets into your bloodstream all at once. But hopefully that never happens. You don't want to have a bleeding event. Okay. When you say, I mean, like, check your finger or something, it's worse. No, it's got to be worse. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You cut your finger, your fight or flight system does not go off and cause splenic contraction. Okay. But yeah. like, if you cut yourself, like, doing dishes, and it's like, you Maybe. Oh, even more than that? It's I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I don't know if they've determined the level of cutting needed in order to cause splenic contraction. Yes, I would not offer to be in that study, right? Your platelets are really short-lived, okay? They get removed by macrophages from all of your tissues, right? And here they hang out in your spleen, about a third of them. And then when you have a bleeding event, sympathetic nervous system causes them to be released. Okay, the hormone thrombopoietin gets released by the liver to increase the number of megakaryocytes. Okay, so erythropoietin causes increase in red blood cells. Thrombopoietin causes increases in platelets. All right, we will finish. All right, so the last topic we're going to talk about with blood is hemostasis, so stopping blood flow. Okay, and we do hemostasis to prevent blood loss from a broken blood vessel. And there are three steps to hemostasis. And blood clotting or coagulation is only one of those steps. Okay, the first step is a vascular spasm. In response to being damaged, that blood vessel is going to vasoconstrict. Right? And when it vasoconstricts, that is going to slow flow of blood through it. Okay, second step is formation of the platelet plug. And this is why we're talking about hemostasis when we talk about platelets. Platelets play a major role in hemostasis. Okay, they form a plug in order to stop flow of blood out of that broken blood vessel. The third and final step is blood clotting or coagulation. And this is when fibrinogen gets converted into fibrin. And in lab, you did that where you saw the fibrin strands when you took your blood sample in the unheparinized tube, right, the blue tube. 
Those strands where fibrinogen had finally been converted into fibrin forms a mesh. All your blood cells get trapped on it and that stops blood flow in that area. Okay, so first step, and sort of the easiest step, is that an injured vessel vasoconstricts. Okay, the sympathetic nervous system can cause vasoconstriction of arterioles and veins. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system can cause vasoconstriction of your arterioles and veins, but also the endothelial cells lining your blood vessels in response to being damaged release a paracrine chemical messenger. And a paracrine chemical messenger is one that just acts locally. Okay. We don't know what that chemical messenger is. So we're just calling it a paracrine chemical messenger. Endothelial cells just release some chemical that tells smooth muscle lining that blood vessel to constrict. Right? And when you have vasoconstriction, that slows blood flow. So this is, happens almost immediately. Okay, second step is platelet plug. And you notice there's a way more bullet points. It's a little more complex, okay? So, first step in platelet plug form formation is von Willebrand factor, right? Which is always circulating in your bloodstream, okay? So von Willebrand factor binds to exposed collagen. So collagen is connective tissue. Right? And when you damage a blood vessel, that connective tissue gets exposed. And von Willebrand factor binds to it. Okay? So it's always circulating in your bloodstream. And when it gets exposed to collagen, it binds. Right? And von Willebrand factor, you can think of it as like Velcro. Right? And it sticks specifically to platelets. Okay? So it adheres to the collagen, and then it starts sticking platelets in the area. Right? There is a genetic disorder where people don't produce von Willebrand factor, right? and it's a bleeding disorder because okay? they don't form their platelet plugs. Okay, The platelets, once they stick to von Willebrand factor, start sticking to each other because they start to release ADP, so adenosine diphosphate. So they clip a phosphate group off of ATP because remember they have organelles so they can generate loads of ATP. Okay, and they use ADP as a signal to other nearby platelets to become sticky. Right, so the platelets stick to the von Willebrand factor, they start releasing ADP. Other nearby platelets become sticky and stick to those adhered platelets. And this happens over and over again. This is an example of positive feedback. Okay, nearby platelets become more sticky. They release more ADP, which become, causes more platelets to become sticky, which then causes more release of ADP. Okay, this is positive feedback. And it would keep going unchecked if undamaged endothelial cells in the area didn't release chemical messengers to stop platelet plug formation. Okay, so those undamaged endothelial cells release prostacyclin and nitric oxide to prevent platelets from sticking to them. And the reason why undamaged endothelial cells don't want platelets sticking to them is because they don't form a really good seal with it because von Willebrand factor isn't sticking to the undamaged endothelial cells. So those platelet plugs that form on undamaged cells can get knocked loose. And if they get knocked loose and lodge in a capillary bed, say, supplying your heart, you have a heart attack, <laughs> right? If they lodge in a capillary bed supplying your brain, you have a stroke, okay? So you only want platelet plugs to form on damaged tissue because they don't stick well to undamaged tissue. Yeah? What was the other item besides prostacyclin? Uh, Nitric oxide. This is the NO. That's what I thought. Yep. Okay, remember platelets are filled with actin and myosin. So during the platelet plug formation, actin and myosin starts to interact, and those platelets squeeze together to strengthen the plug. 
Okay, those platelets also release other chemical messengers. They release serotonin, epinephrine, and thromboxin A2. And that tells nearby smooth muscle to vasoconstrict. So they reinforce the vascular spasm to slow blood flow through the area. Okay, and then platelets also produce coagulation factors for the clotting cascade. So platelets play a big role in hemostasis. Right, so here, rather than all those words, we've got two cartoons. So here we have a normal blood vessel, okay, that is undamaged. Here are the collagen fibers. They are not exposed, so that means von Willebrand factor is not binding. Plus undamaged endothelial cells are releasing prostacyclin and nitric oxide to prevent any platelets from sticking to them. They're saying, hey, we got no problems, don't stick to us, okay? In a damaged vessel, that collagen gets exposed and the von Willebrand factor binds to it, okay? And then the von Willebrand factor makes platelets in the area bind to it. And then those platelets in the area start to release ADP and thromboxin A2, which work in a positive feedback mechanism to cause even more and more and more platelets to adhere, right? And you get a plug that's stopping blood from leaving the damaged vessel. Okay, the last step in hemostasis is clot formation. And the blood clot reinforces the platelet plug by converting liquid blood into a non-flowing gel. Okay, clotting factors are always circulating around in your bloodstream, but they are inactive. Right? Once the vessel gets damaged and exposes collagen, that exposed collagen, not only does it initiate the platelet plug, it also initiates the clotting cascade by activating some of the clotting factors. Okay? The end result of the clotting cascade is fibrinogen, which is a plasma protein always circulating in the bloodstream. Anytime you see ogen at the end, that means it's inactive, okay? Fibrinogen gets converted into fibrin. So the whole point of the clotting cascade is to convert fibrinogen into fibrin, right? And then fibrin forms that mesh network, everything gets trapped on it, you get a gel formed. Okay, so the clotting cascade involves 12 plasma clotting factors, right? And there is an intrinsic pathway and an extrinsic pathway. The end result of both the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway is fibrinogen gets converted into fibrin, okay? The intrinsic pathway involves seven steps. Extrinsic involves only four steps. Okay, so the extrinsic pathway is faster. And the reason that's important is if the extrinsic pathway gets activated, that means blood is spilling into your tissues, right? So you want the clot to happen really fast. Okay, the intrinsic pathway starts when factor 12, which is also known as the Hagman factor, gets activated by coming into contact with exposed collagen or it gets activated when your blood hits glass, i.e. when you draw your blood out of your finger in lab, right? So you were activating the intrinsic pathway by removing the blood from your bloodstream and putting it into a glass test tube. Okay, the extrinsic pathway requires contact with tissue factors that are outside of the bloodstream. Okay. There's this stuff called tissue thromboplastic that gets released from traumatized tissue. So say you get run over by a car, right? You get a lot of traumatized tissue from that. 
Okay, it's going to release tissue thromboplastic, which is going to directly activate factor 10, which is going to set off the clotting cascade. And so they oftentimes, when you've had a lot of traumatized tissue, will give you anticoagulants because all that traumatized tissue is releasing that thromboplastic factor and it can cause excessive clotting. Okay, so here we have the clot pathways. What I want you to notice is A, I couldn't fit it all on one long string, okay? So we have a blow up up here, right? We've got the intrinsic pathway and we've got the extrinsic pathway, okay? So seven steps for the intrinsic pathway, four for the extrinsic, okay? So the extrinsic is faster. Okay, I also want you to notice there's calcium involved. So calcium acts as a cofactor. So for those of you who work in a hospital setting, sometimes you collect blood with heparinized tubes. Heparin prevents coagulation. Or sometimes you collect blood in tubes with EDTA. What EDTA does is it actually binds free calcium. So it prevents clotting as well. Okay. So we've got this series of reactions. So let's look up here, because the end of the clotting cascade is fibrinogen, is converted into fibrin, and that fibrin is loose, okay? And then activated factor 13A stabilizes that fibrin. Okay, so we have this series of reactions, right? Thrombin, positively feeds back, right, to cause even more thrombin to be produced. So the clotting cascade is also an example of positive feedback, right? And having all these different reactions, besides giving you a headache, you don't have to memorize them, so it shouldn't give you too much of a headache, means you have lots of chances for amplification so that you get a really rapid response. Because if you have a bleeding event, if blood is spilling into your tissues, you want your clot to form really quickly. Okay, but because positive feedback, you also want to start stopping that clot because you want, don't want that clot to overgrow. Right? So the end product of clot formation is fibrinogen, gets converted into the loose fibrin, which then forms the meshy fibrin, which forms the blood clot. So here is a micrograph of an actual blood clot. So these are all the mesh fibrin strands that have trapped the blood cells on them. This blood is now a gel. It's no longer moving. See what it does today. Normally, the flow of blood through blood vessels is unimpeded. Red cells, white cells, and platelets pass over the unbroken lining of endothelial cells. Its smoothness discourages their adhesion. But there exists, within this supporting framework of proteins and mucopolysaccharides, an emergency mechanism capable of reducing blood loss by promoting coagulation. This is the extracellular matrix, or ECM. The first reaction to an injury involving the epithelium comes from the damaged epithelial cells themselves. They release endothelin, a polypeptide which causes smooth muscle in the wall of the artery to contract, as do nerve impulses arriving in response to the injury. As a result, less blood is lost because the vessel is narrowed at the site of injury. The exposed ECM releases von Willebrand factor. This attracts platelets to the damaged area and promotes adhesion between these platelets. It forms bridges between platelets and the underlying extracellular matrix. Von Willebrand factor is also found on the surface of epithelial cells and in platelets as alpha granules. As platelets adhere to one another and to the extracellular matrix thanks to von Willebrand factor, they become activated, causing a reorganization of their actin fibers and a change in their shape. 
This in turn exposes their lipoprotein surface to the blood clotting factors. The activated platelets now release adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, and increase the synthesis of thromboxane A2, both of which boost platelet attraction. Both of these molecules attract more platelets to the injury site, expanding the platelet mass and further plugging the breach. Secondary hemostasis is the process of stabilizing the clot. It begins with the coagulation cascade, a sequence of events which develops with explosive speed, ending in the formation of a fibrin clot. It starts when factor seven binds to tissue factor. This activated complex attaches itself to the platelet surface, setting the cascade in motion. It activates factor 10 so that there is a rapid increase in the level of activated factor 10, 10A in the blood. Activated factor 10 cleaves prothrombin, yielding thrombin. In turn, thrombin cleaves fibrinogen to form strands of fibrin. We have been tracing the rapid response pathway of clot formation from injury to the cells lining blood vessels through to the formation of the fibrin network. This pathway is known as the extrinsic system. But there is another slower pathway called the intrinsic system, which may be triggered by exposure of blood to a negatively charged surface, such as collagen or glass. The two systems are indeed complementary pathways which join at the level of activation of factor 10. Polymerized fibrin forms a network which anchors blood cells and platelets in the clot. I like that video because it shows it like a pinball machine. I think it's a pretty nice analogy. Okay, so clots are not permanent and you don't want them overgrowing. Okay, so you want to dissolve the clot once scar tissue has been formed. Okay, so we have these fibroblasts in the surrounding connective tissue. They form a scar, right? And when scar tissue is formed, the clot can be dissolved, right? So plasmin is what's called a fibrinolytic enzyme. It breaks down fibrin strands. Okay, and when the fibrin is dissolved, the clot disappears. Okay, it's produced by the liver in an inactive form that's always circulating in the bloodstream. And that inactive form is called plasminogen. Okay, and ogen means inactive. As soon as the clotting cascade starts, plasminogen gets activated. Again, because the clotting cascade is positive feedback. And without any sort of check imbalances, you'd have these clots overgrowing and they won't <laughs> adhere well to undamaged tissue. Just like a play of the plug, if a clot dislodges and lodges itself in another capillary bed, supplying your heart, heart attack, brain, you have a stroke. Okay. So plasminogen gets converted into plasmin as soon as factor 12 gets activated in the clotting cascade. Okay, and then the cleanup crew comes. So the phagocytes, what are the two types of phagocytes we've talked about? Leukocytes. Which sites? Leukocytes. Yeah. Which type of, yes, they are leukocytes, good. Neutrophils. Neutrophils and? Nope, but thanks for guessing. Neutrophils and it starts with an M. Monocytes once they become macrophages. Okay, so neutrophils and macrophages are going to phagocytize any of the debris, completely removing the clot. Any red blood cells in the area that got trapped and are no longer functional, right? Any of that fibrin that has become loose because of plasmin. All right. Any questions about blood? Right.